So good morning. It's pretty hard to follow Philippe. Uh, Nancy asked me to represent the youth that was drawn to the Hoving Revolution. As I had just celebrated my 70th birthday, this was quite flattering. Uh, we must remember that Tom was only 36 when he became director of the Met, and many of us were in our 20s. We were all more or less idealistic, and for sure enthusiastic and energetic, and many of us are here today. It was 1968. The times were famously a changing, and the Met was a prime site to confront the issues of the day the end of elitism, increasing the relevance of old institutions, attracting new and diverse audiences, and generally renewing and opening up the greatest art museum in the world. And of course, Tom was just the guy to do it. He had all the classic credentials, the Princeton PhD, the curatorial triumphs at the cloisters, but Tom also was an agent of change and was usually pleased to tweak the nose of authority. Tom was always ready to try out a new idea and showed remarkable resilience when they didn't work out. This, in fact, happened quite frequently. <laughs> and I thought I might focus on some of the, well, not mistakes, but some of the adventures. Decentralization was a big buzzword of the time especially when the scope of the Met's master plan became known. Tom determined that we would simultaneously reach out to the boroughs of New York and take actual pieces from the Met to them. And always one for extra creativity and drama, Tom remembered the inflatable domes used to shelter the Parks Department tennis courts in winter. And he commissioned a trailer truck whose sides could be lowered and a full dome inflated over the exhibition cases of museum objects. It was called Eye Opener. It took about 20 minutes to set up and looked great in the Met parking lot. When we went to the first neighborhood stop at Prospect Hospital in the Bronx, the reaction was terrific, but that night the kids couldn't resist puncturing the balloon. And this was repeated wherever we went, <laughs> with the inflatable becoming increasingly bandaged as we, as we dragged it home. Tom was unfazed, but wanted a new strategy. What worked much better was to cooperate with existing neighborhood groups on their own turf and provide assistance, display cases, and support Susan Bader, Lowry Sims, and Herb McManus worked with the Studio Museum and El Museo del Barrio in their formative years. And we actually helped create the exhibition spaces at the Bronx County Courthouse, the Queens Museum, and Sailor's Snug Harbor in Staten Island. Uh, Tom believed in popularization. And the much intensified program of special exhibitions were great opportunities to present a theme, focus, and educate. There had been, of course, temporary exhibitions before. But Tom, with some help from George Tresher and Stuart Silver, elevated the activity in many ways. One way was the education or orientation gallery. The theme of the great age of fresco was a conservation story how the great treasures of Florence were saved by CREA, the Committee to Rescue Italian Art, after the devastating flood of the Arno. Tom wanted the public to appreciate the process by which Renaissance frescoes were pulled off the walls of flooded buildings. We set up a stage at the beginning of the exhibition and had college art history majors deliver the spiel. You hung a canvas over a large photograph of the uh, fresco, glued it, ripped it off, revealing the fresco coming off and beneath the synopia, the uh, drawing underneath, which was then itself ripped off the wall. This was all done with Velcro. 
fasteners along the side, and there was a long, satisfying rip <laughs> as the frescoes came off the wall. However, there were a group of Italian conservators <laughs> who were traveling with the show, and they complained to Ted, Rosa, uh, Ted Rousseau that it just wasn't that simple. Tom stood by us, and the demos went on. Tom was fascinated by any new technology and early on saw the potential of TV as an art education medium. Charlie Reitzman was excited about a new TV series and told Tom he would be willing to acquire the American rights for the Met. Tom sent me down to see the pilot, and I returned with the verdict that the host was too stuffy and Americans would have too tough a time with a British accent. It was, of course, Kenneth Clark's Civilization, <laughs> which shows how little I knew. Tom backed me up, but never let me forget it. <laughs> Tom gave a lot of young people exceptional opportunities to innovate and take on real responsibility. So many of us here today owe our first museum work experience to Tom's encouragement and willingness to take risks. In recent years, Tom and Nancy would stop for a night with Ellen and me in Vieques, Puerto Rico. After Christmas, spent with Treya's family in Anguilla. Tom flew his own airplane. His uh, sense of adventure was totally intact. Ostensibly, he needed a gas stop. And every, after having called ahead to make sure that there was gas at the Vieques airport, was a little surprised to find that they hadn't told him that although Vieques did have gas, the pump was broken <laughs> and had been for two years. <laughs> Tom, with Nancy as co-pilot, headed off to Fajardo with short rations. On these occasions, Tom's enthusiasm and energy were undiminished and his storytelling talent intact. He was a natural comedian and actor, and the tales were accompanied by dramatic eyebrow lifts, and usually involved imitations of several accents, and always colorful language. Some picked up in the Marines, I think. Uh, in these stories, he always had the starring role. <laughs> Staff meetings always involved a show, hilarious impersonations of trustees and missing colleagues, and lots of laughter. There was always a ball in the air, and usually a dozen or more. I never had more fun. <laughs>